Join us for the very first IFL Live at London's Indigo at the O2, Sunday, August the 13th, with me, Coogan Cassius, and some very special guests, Eddie Hearn, Darren Barker, Johnny Fisher, and more. Tickets now on sale. So in the words of Eddie Hearn... You get up, you dress up, and you fucking show up. Hello and welcome to Raw the Fight Within podcast with me, Coogan Cassius. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Mr. Ty Mitchell. This is a take two. Because I attempted to do this a couple of weeks ago and it just, it wasn't to be. It wasn't to be. Your fault, we're Look, blaming it, you. It absolutely was my <laughs> fault. So yeah, take two, uh, appreciate you doing this for the second time. Um, right, Ty, we obviously, before we kind of get into stuff, just wanted to ease you into this um, quite easily, gently rather. Um, I mean, for yourself, what were the first ever memories of boxing for you? I think probably my dad boxing. Um, my dad was a um, heavyweight boxer, um, I guess before I was born. Um, and then I think he retired when I was about seven. So up until then, I remember my dad just being a boxer or being out in town with him and people asking him for autographs and stuff because there was no camera phones back then. So people's coming up to him with pieces of papers and pens and like, I oh, can I have your autograph and things like that. So he was um, quite known in Derby, per se. Um, but yeah, that, I guess that was my uh, first, him and Naz, because he used to train with Naz. Um, so I guess they, them two was my first memories of boxing. Yeah, I mean, for you, obviously, because your dad was a professional fighter, probably still thinks he is one, to be honest. Yeah, I think he definitely but, does. Yeah. <laughs> um, but obviously, aside from like that kind of family connection to boxing, you say like Nassim was one yeah. of the most, yeah, like the early influences for you. Yeah, I remember watching Naz as a kid and I just was mesmerised by Naz. Like, Naz was probably the biggest reason I got into boxing myself. Um, I just used to be mesmerised by him, the way he'd flip over the ropes, he'd like dodge punches, he was like the Matrix. I just found him so entertaining. But apart from that, like, I knew him, so I was around him a lot growing up. So he was a bit weird because I was a kid, so like, you don't understand fame and stuff as a kid. And I'd been to London with him and he was just getting mobbed. He'd even come to my nan's house on a, in Derby on like a, on a place called Aussie Park Road and literally he just got out of the car with me and my dad and walked into the house, like literally straight in. Next minute, the house outside was just chock a block. There were so many fans just crowded, the surrounded the house. He had to leg it out the back door because he literally couldn't get out. Um, yeah, so it was a bit weird. I didn't understand because to me, it was just like, oh, he's my dad's mate. Do you know what I mean? I didn't really understand the mate. I was only a kid. Um, so I never really, I found it all a bit weird. But as you get older, you understand why. But yeah, Naz and my dad was definitely my uh, first memories of boxing. I was... Um at the, the press conference the other day, uh, and Naz was there at the Usyk and Dubois press conference, so I don't know if you saw a clip that went around well, of Usyk, Usyk saying that he yeah. used to uh, imitate Naz's style as an amateur, which is quite interesting to hear. The funniest thing I found about that whole thing was when he said to Naz, Usyk, is just, we've just spoke to Usyk and he said he used to try and mimic you, and Naz just went, can't no one mimic me, what's he trying to mimic me for? <laughs> That's the funniest thing I thought about it all. Like, Naz has never changed ever since I've ever known him, which has been, what, it must be over 25 years now. He's never changed one bit. You're just, you're just thinking, can't copy me, I'm the best, are you going to copy me? Like, such a legend. But yeah, it was, um, I think Naz had, a, I, I don't think Naz really even himself understands the influence he's had in boxing. Like, people, like, especially at this generation of boxing, grew up on Naz. So he, I think he's the reason that a lot of people, that especially in this generation, box because there's only one Naz, isn't he? And he was the first, he wasn't trying to copy no one. He is his own blueprint, do you know what I mean? So mm. uh, He probably doesn't realise kind of the scope he's had on, uh, on boxing, not just British boxing, but just boxing, boxing in, yeah. in general across like, different decades um, because he's, he's in that bubble, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's only us that kind of see the scope of it from the outside. 100%, yeah. I don't think he will have to understand the magnitude. I think he knows he's a star, for sure, because Naz knows. But I don't think he really knows the magnitude of the people that he's reached generationally. Like, he knew he, the man in his time, but I don't think he understands how much it tears down. Like, everybody knows Nas. I was here the other day with him. He was here the other day and was playing golf and stuff. And it's just like, just everybody knows him. And, I, and, and do you know what's mad? Like, I'm very close with his sons, Adam and Sammy. And even Sol, when he's around, he's the youngest one, Sol. Um, but like, what's mad is, my dad and his dad grew up together in the gym. And our dad's never introduced us. 
we met each other organically. Imagine that. So these two grew up together in the gym. There's fighting, there's sparring, this and that. And the way that God works, he's put us together now. So their kids are now in the gym and we're sparring each other and having a laugh. And we get on. It was mad when I met him. It's like I've known him my whole life. Like literally, we just clicked. I've known him a few years now, but like the first time I met him, we just clicked and we've just been, and we're like proper, like close and it's mad. And it must be, you know, because our dads were so close and they have, we all have the same kind of personalities that we all just gel, man. It's, it, it's, a mad, it's mad. Yeah, they're my boys, man. They're my brothers, man. I love them too, man. Good kids. And they're just about to make his pro debut as well, Adam, so he's going to smash it. On that, Usyk um, and Dubois yeah. undercard in Poland. Um, do you remember the first ever fight you went to? I think it was like an amateur, probably, I think. No one ever I, remembers this question, honestly. I ask loads of people. I don't this. remember, and but don't actually remember. I can remember. I don't even know if it was my first one, but I do remember my best mate, um, Casey, his dad, was in primary school. I had probably been about seven, eight. He was in primary school and uh, his dad took us to a welfare club where you could still smoke inside, so it was full of smoke, and it was, and it was out of the car in Langley Mill, it was called, just in the countryside. And there was a boxing show that I remember going to, that's probably as far back as I remember, but I don't believe it was my first boxing match I'd been to, but it was like an amateur boxing match. Mm. And it was like, I remember the first time I boxed, it was in a welfare club, and you could, I remember walking down, and on the top of the roof was just a big, thick layer of smoke. And I remember boxing, and I could taste all the smoke in my mouth, it was horrible. But yeah, it was a similar kind of venue to that, yeah, that I can remember. That's the first one I can remember, but... I don't know if it's the first one I went to. I always find this next one quite interesting. Um, and especially for you, this is interesting because we'll come on to your, kind of, your time out of boxing. Yeah. Um, if you wasn't in the industry of boxing or hadn't been for kind of a large proportion of your life, what do you think <coughs> you could have been doing, like profession-wise or just something that attempted to... To replace that, I don't think there is a thing to replace it, but you know what I mean. Do you know what? I generally don't know. And I'll tell you for why. I started boxing when I was seven. <coughs> and I've boxed ever since. So I can't think. And it's mad because someone was asking me my passion, yeah? And I generally don't have a passion. I don't even have a passion for boxing. I don't have a passion for anything. Like, it's mad. Like, I sometimes think, okay, what would I do every day if I didn't get paid for it? And I don't know. Because I get... I don't find things um, fulfilling it all, really. Like, there's a lot, not enough to do it every day. So I find it hard to think, oh, what would I do every day if it was for free? So I don't know. I just do whatever. Whatever made the most money or whatever I thought I was good at, I would make money. Whatever that is, I'm not sure because I've kind of put all my eggs in one basket for most of my life. Um, so to answer your question, Coogan, I don't know. Would you like to have thought you were doing? Does that make sense? Put him. Like, if you... What would you have liked to have thought? Not necessarily it was realistic or... Probably I would never work for anybody because it's just not my nature. I'm not good at being told what to do. I got, I'm not controlling over other people. I let people do what they want. I just don't like people having control over me. I don't like being told what to do and when to do it. So maybe property, something like that maybe. Um, or start some form of business or company. I don't know. I wouldn't work for no one in it. So whatever it would have been, it would have been self-employed. It, it's it's dif it's difficult because, like I said, for you and a lot of fighters that I've spoke to, or even people just involved in this in, in the industry, they've been doing it for that long. Now, it's almost like there isn't an alternate in their mind. Yeah, yeah, sense, yeah, yeah. You don't know any. I literally don't know any different. Mm. Boxing isn't me. It's something I do, but it's something I've done for so long that I don't really know. I I generally don't know a life without it because I can't remember before boxing really. Do you know what I mean? I actually don't remember the... F actually, I remember... Actually, no, what I was going to say, I don't remember the first time I went in a gym and started training, but I do remember around the time is when my dad opened up a gym in St. James's Street in Derby, uh, One Nation, that was in 1997, so that was when I started training. But I don't really remember anything before. Like, I don't remember ambition or anything before it. So I guess it's the same with a lot of fighters, especially when you box from so young. I guess, but there is some boxers that did start old though, so I guess they might know. But for me, yeah, no, I started, when, I've done it my whole life, so I was raised in the gym. Do you remember like any specific altercation you got into as a, as a child, as a teenager, anything that sticks out? Were you kind of a bit of a, an aggressive, aggy kid or not? Now my thing was this, I wouldn't really start fights, I'd never walk away. I had uh, too much, not even too much pride, I was too insecure, that's what it was. 
I was a very insecure kid, very, very insecure kid. I didn't realise it till I get older. You don't really know about emotional intelligence. I didn't really understand emotional intelligence until I got a bit older. Um, probably for the past five years, I didn't really understand emotional intelligence. So, yeah, I wouldn't start him, but <clears throat> I wouldn't walk away whether there's one guy there or ten. I've literally had a fight with ten guys before. Um, didn't win, but I did my best. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It was that number ten to one, but it... Um, yeah, I, I, I was never aggressive. I was never angry, though. I was never an angry kid. I've never, ever once in my life lost my temper, ever. I don't know how to lose my temper. Maybe that's because I grew up in the gym and you, self, and you taught self-control. I don't know, but I've never lost my temper. But I was insecure, so I got into plenty of street fights when I was younger, which turned out to be my demise as I got older. But if I knew then what I knew now, I wouldn't have made certain decisions that I've made. Talk to me... Uh, about a point in your life where you felt as though you were fighting a losing battle? Sorry. Hmm. Well, it seems this is a boxing show. We'll keep it relevant. Uh, probably fighting a losing battle against the British Boxing Board of Control. I think I was quite naive and young to think that they actually cared about wanting people to give them a chance at redemption to build a life. Because boxing saves a lot of people's lives, as we all know. Um, and I feel like no one's perfect in this world. Everyone's made mistakes. And I felt that with the boxing board, they really want to help people turn their lives around, give them a chance at redemption, to change their life, to maybe even spread their message to stop people making the same mistakes as you've made in your past. They don't care about that. They don't care. Um, they're not bothered about helping people. As long as if your face don't fit, then that's it. There's no, they're not bothered. As simple as that. They think that they're the court of law of their own. Do you think, do you think they're judges? Do you think they're, and they're not. They're just normal people. They're a limited company for starters. They're not even governed by anybody so they can make it up as they go along. But guess look, they've let people box. But I think because there's no com competitors to them, they can just do what they want when they want. So I think that was a point where I was trying to fight a losing battle. And it was never straightforward with me, which was a bit annoying because I wasted years of my life when they were saying, yeah, yeah, just wait a bit like this and that, and they just lied, basically. So not only did they uh, not give me a chance of redemption, they lied as well. I maybe wasted even more years of my life. So, but listen, everything happens for a reason. So it was a lesson learned. Obviously, for some context about what you're talking about, and I know you've kind of been very open about this in previous interviews and podcasts. Um, but obviously the, the situation that's kind of led on from uh, your licensing issues with the board was from, um, well, a situation, a very bad situation that occurred years ago that I wanted you to touch on, if you would. Yeah, so to be honest with you, it's hard. I've only spoke about it in two podcasts. I've done loads of podcasts and I've only actually spoke about it in two and the reason is, is I, I find it hard. I'm a bit embarrassed about it, but at the same time is I have to overcome that to try and spread a message to make people not make the mistakes I've made. So that's why I kind of try and speak out on it a bit when I can, but that's just because I just want people to learn from my mistakes. That's the only reason. But basically I was on a night out in 2011, so over 10 years ago. Um, that 12 years ago now, yeah. So. 2011, there was, a, there was an altercation between a, a, someone in the group that I was with and another person. Um, they ended up, Garrett decided to go outside for a fight. The other guys rang his mates, they've turned up. The guy that was in our group got battered by this guy, got punched in. Me and this other guy ended up in a bit of a verbal altercation. We tried to leave the scene, um, but the taxi driver wouldn't let us in the taxi because the guy was with obviously got beat up, so he had a lot of blood all over him and he said he can't get in the taxi. So we've gone back round the corner and me and the guy that beat him up have crossed paths again. Another verbal altercation started and um, he stepped towards me, I stepped towards him, I hit him. His friends jumped over him, hit me, so I've hit him. They've both dropped, I've got in the taxi and left. I got arrested later on that night. Um, uh, then the, well, I was in the normally in the police station for like 24 hours max. They kept me in there for like three days. So I thought there's something not right here, what's going on kind of thing. They told me that oh, one of them's on a life support machine and it's not looking good, etc., etc. 
So I, they remanded me on a section 18, which is a grievously body armed with intent. Um, then I found out five days later when I was in remand in jail that he had passed away, which obviously was a big shock because I thought, that I'd been told in that meantime that he was basically okay. So they re-arrested me and charged me with murder. So I had to go back to the police station, get re-interviewed, re-arrested, re-charged with murder. And I think like nine months later, I went to trial and they found me not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. But they did offer me a manslaughter plea or a Section 18 plea before the trial. But I said, no, it was self-defence. Um, at the time, I said it was self-defence and I'm not taking a plea and I never killed him because the hospital actually killed him. There's a lot of negligence at the hospital. Um, they punctured his lung and then they put him on a faulty ventilator machine that ultimately killed him. And uh, a pathologist came to the court and said he had no life threatening injuries until he went to hospital. So I was like, well, how are you going to charge him with murder if, or manslaughter if I've not actually killed him? And they said, well, you're basically as bad as the hospital. If you never put him in hospital, he wouldn't have been subject to the negligence from the hospital. So I said, not guilty. Um, and then I got found guilty of manslaughter. And I was bitter at the time, to be honest. I was very annoyed. I thought, one, I've not killed him. So, and, he, and, and I got eight years. And the person that went in just before me, he'd hit someone with a bat and killed him. And it was his second manslaughter and he got three years. So I'm thinking, this is the first time I've ever been charged with a serious crime in my life. And you're going to give me eight years and you give this geezer that just hit someone with a bat and killed him three years. And it's his second manslaughter. So I was a bit, I was very annoyed about it. Um, and, I was, and I was bitter at the guy, I was like, you started this, like, and now look, I'm in a situation. But as I got older and I got released from prison, I'm glad to give me that sentence. And I actually, I'm an advocate that they should give people longer sentences for one punch manslaughter. I think you should get 10 years minimum for it. I understand it's a freak accident and it's a mistake and nobody intends to hurt anybody that bad when they just throw one punch. But people have lost their lives from it. Now, I've got the chance to build my life back up. My family get to, got to see me when I was in prison. My family get to see me now. I've managed to have my son myself. I get a chance at life, he doesn't. So what is eight years? I did four years inside. What is that? In comparison, it's nothing. So I think that they're, I'm glad they give me that long. I think they should have given me longer and I think that they should give the other people longer, I think, because it's very common. People don't see it a lot in the news. It's always about stabbings and stuff like this which is horrific. I can't stand people with knives. I think you're just a coward and you're scared. That's why you've got a knife. You're not a real man. I don't think any man that carries a knife is a real man. I get some instances where they carry it for self-protection because everybody's got them. But I think if you carry enough to go and stab people, you're, you're a coward. Um, but manslaughter, one punch manslaughter is a lot more common than people think. So people need to realise that when you're out in town, I, look, most people have had a fight in town or had a fight in their life. Do you know what I mean? It's very common. I don't know many people that haven't. And it only takes one punch. And not only are you going to ruin your life, you're going to ruin someone else's life. And it's a hard reality to deal with. Like, I've, li I've got a life sentence because I have to live with that reality. Like, he, ha he has a mother that loved him. He has sisters. He has brothers. He has a family that loved him. And because I was too insecure to walk away, that, that, now I've put that family through misery. And it hurts a lot to live with that. It's a hard reality to live with. And I just wish I'd have just walked away. And regardless to who was in the right, who was in the wrong, was both in the wrong that night. Was both could have walked away. And I could, and I never, I could have walked away even more. I didn't have to hit him. I could have pushed him. I could have restrained him. I knew that he wasn't able to hurt me. Do you know what I mean? I not hurt me because he could have hit me and knocked me out. But I wasn't scared. I'm not really. I wasn't. Do you know what I mean? So it was just insecurities. I literally remember. I actually remember looking back at the point where. I thought, yeah, there's no way I'm going to let him mug me off. Because I looked around and there was Gil standing there. There's some other lads standing there. And I just remember thinking, yeah, there's no way I can let you. Like, I've just felt too embarrassed to now to walk away. If that happened now, and it has happened since I've come home, I've had people push me, I've had people start me, I've had people swing for me. And I literally, it, and I don't, that feeling doesn't come up anymore. I know I can, I can knock you out. What's that going to prove? Either I don't want to put myself in that situation again. And I didn't want to go back to prison. I've got a son I need to raise. So, but that's just growing up and maturing. I think one thing kids and young boys need to do is go to therapy. Therapy helped me a lot. Because you don't, we're never taught emotional intelligence. Like who teaches kids emotional intelligence? Nobody. 
Like, it's not, it's not in the school curriculum. It's not in nothing. So unless you're paying for therapy, which a lot of people can't afford, especially these people from poverty-stricken areas, they don't know about emotional intelligence. They don't know where it comes from and stuff like this. So I think it's important, and that's why I started my own charity. I go into schools. I speak to kids. I go to um, Mostly I go to behavioural schools where the kids have been kicked out of other schools and they've got behavioural problems and they're always kicking off and this and that. And I spend time with them. I'm like, no, look, I used to be just like you because I didn't do well in school. I got kicked out of school. Um, and I just try and look. It's a cliche, but even if I stop one person going to prison for the same thing I did, I've done something right because I can't, I can't bring him back. No matter what I do, there's no power that I can bring him back and I can't take back what happened. So the next best thing I can do is try and stop other people doing the same thing to somebody else's family. So that's the reason I started on my charity and it means a lot to me. I think obviously when you talk about an occurrence that obviously happened to you in the most like tragic way it could have ended, but that situation you're talking about happens obviously not where we are here, back home in England on a daily, weekly, monthly, whatever basis yeah. in, in all parts of the country. And you're right, even though the intent isn't there to cause that kind of level of, you know, yeah. but the possibility of happening is always there in that kind of situation. And nobody Which expects it to happen, do you know what I mean? And it happens a lot. I don't think it, because it's portrayed in the media a lot, people understand how, how common it is. And if people knew, they might think twice before just throwing punches, do you know what I mean? And they just walk away and it's always over nothing. It always happens over nothing. So it's mostly people that don't even know each other, one's looked at each other wrong or the one's stepped on someone's It's the most trivial things and people are losing lives over nothing. And it's actually devastating. Like when you really look at it, you don't even know each other, you've not even got a problem with each other like that. It's just egos and insecurities. Mm -hmm. That's why people need to work on emotional intelligence. And once they know where it comes from, like, okay, he's looking at me, why do I now feel that I have to be the big man? It always comes, it always comes, it all comes from somewhere. Everything that we've, it's all learnt behaviour, it's all come from somewhere. That's why I think people need to, I think schools really need to put it in the curriculum, emotional intelligence. Not just because of fine, just in all aspects of life, relationships, work relationships, how you, how you talk to yourself, how you feel about yourself. I just think emotional intelligence is something that really needs to be in a school curriculum. Did prison change you, and if so, how did it change you? It did, it did. In because, a positive way? Yeah, 100%. I think I needed to, I reckon if I was in there just for a year or 18 months, it might not have changed me so much. Um, but I think I grew up in prison. I think from 19 or 20, I was, and I come out 24. That's a big chunk of my early growing years, from a boy to a man. Mm. And I grew up in prison. Um, but I think because I got so long, I really missed them. I saw the devastation. I saw all the things I missed out on. And I seen, I got a family that are good. I've got a good family that love me and care about me. I had no business even going to prison. I'm not from an estate where I've got one parent or my dad's ran off and left me and all this. I'm very, very blessed, very blessed to have the family I do. They love me, they care about me, they do anything for me. And when I see what I put them through, it was just a reality check, like, what are you doing? Like, and it's just because I was an insecure little kid. So I had a lot of time. I remember I was just by myself in a cell for four years, 23 hours a day. Had a lot of time to have honest conversations with myself. And it kept going for years. Even when I come out of jail, it came, it was going on for years. I was having to have a lot of hard, honest conversations with myself. And some of them was hard. When you're having a deep, honest conversation with yourself and about your, your faults and who you are and what you want to become, it's hard, man. And it broke me a lot of the time. I've, I've been in dark places. I've been in more dark places out of prison than in prison. In prison, it was, you kind of also have to become someone you don't want to just to survive in there because there's a lot of real killers in there. There's a lot of real gangsters in there. So if you, yeah, you have to kind of adopt someone that you don't want to be. And I didn't like being that person, but I know I can fit in no matter where I go. I can be sit I could be literally in the most ghetto parts of the country or in a board meeting with business millionaires and I'll fit in no matter where I am because I know how to hold a conversation and I know how to act. But in prison, yeah, we got, there's certain situations in prison and I had to be someone I didn't want to be, but that was just survival. And it's not nice being in survival mode. You want to be relaxed. That's why I love Dubai. There's no survival mode. You can walk down. There's no violence here. There's just, you just, it's just peaceful. 
Um, but when I left, there was no chance I was going back. Like before then, I was always, I'd had loads of street fights in my life. Um, just not being able to walk away from fights. I've never had one since, ever. So it changed me in a good way because there's no way I'm going to put myself in a situation where that can happen again. No chance. Despite the fact that you've, you know, you've, first of all, you've, t you've taken responsibility, um, you've, you've been convicted, you've spent your time in prison, do you still think that this situation will slightly hold you back forever? In your life or not? In what context? In, in just obviously that's a that's a, a huge thing that's happened. Yeah. Um, but just trying to kind of move away from it, do you think like you'll probably never quite be able to move away from no, it? No, yeah, no. Yeah, there's always going to be a dark cloud yeah, over my head. Sort of yeah, it's always going to there's always going to be a dark cloud over my head. I think because I was involved and it's very personal to me, it's very much still there with me from the outside somebody that doesn't have no emotion to it a lot of people are just like yeah but look everyone has a fight he didn't mean it his intention to try and minimize it and it actually offends me that they try and minimize it because now i'm thinking you're just not even taking into account you're not even taking into fact to this person's family but they wasn't there they didn't see the trial they didn't see the parents and things like that so they've got no emotional to it but I, even though i know they're saying it to be to try and make me feel better it, it almost offends me. Like, no, it's, it is a big deal. And what happened was bad and what happened was devastating. And it's always going to be with me. But from the outside, people just think, oh, people have fights every day, think these things happen. Yeah, these things do happen, but they shouldn't. Do you know what I mean? They shouldn't happen. So it's no excuse. So I don't like when people try and minimise it because I think it's a disservice to him and his family. So don't minimise it. It was serious and it was bad. And I deserve to go to prison and people should get longer. What are the everyday battles of Ty Mitchell today? Myself. Myself. So, I spend so much time by myself, unhealthy amounts of time by myself, in my room. And I think that's a combination of a few things. I grew up with my mum till I was 10 with my brothers and my sisters. And then at 10, I moved to my dad's house. And I lived there ever since, well, till I've grown up. So from 10, I moved there and I went to my secondary school, but my my dad and my stepmom was at work, and then I'd come back and they'd either be out at work, they'd all be, so I was just basically going home, being by myself, getting up, getting myself ready for school, catching two buses to school, coming back, probably going to the gym. So I was just by myself all my childhood growing up. Then in 1920, I went to prison and I was in a cell for four years by myself. Then I come out and I'm still by myself. Maybe it's a combination of just being alone my whole life and also being a bit institutionalised. I spend so much time by myself in my room and I'm comfortable. Um, I kind of don't, like sometimes I'll be out and I just think, can't wait to go back home. My social battery is so small. Um, so I'll just be in my room. Like even my mate I live with here, he's like, why do you always, like this is the bit, nice living room, right? I never come in here, ever. I never sit here and watch TV, ever just be in my room. So on an unhealthy amount, and I find it hard to get motivated and certain things for some things. And I just think I don't believe in myself as much as I should. I think that's a big, I think that's a big, um, a big battle of mine. I think I'm capable of good things, excellent things, but I just don't, sometimes I think that nah, not you, it's not, do you know what I mean? I just think great things are for the people, not me. I think I need to be, have a bit more self-worth, if that makes sense. Do you feel like you're still fighting demons in your life? Yeah, I fight demons every day. But I think everybody does, man. I think everybody has demons. Just knowing what they are as well. Cause yeah, I think identifying them, knowing where they yeah, come from helps. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah, if you know where they come from and you know what they are, it helps. But it's like I know what I want and I know how to get there, but I'm not capable sometimes, do you know what I mean? Um, but we're great in this. Life's a journey. Life's a journey. But I'd, Go on. Sorry. Yeah, I definitely have down days um, here and there. But I try and, I don't say I'm depressed, but sometimes I'm down. Because I just come back from a trip to Gambia, and it was a really good trip. I went with my friend Abu Bakr, who invited me there, and he's got orphanages there, and, uh, and uh, it's called Spot Project. The, the, um, the orphanage is called Spot Project, or the, the charity's called Spot Project. And I was going, spending time with the kids in the orphan, orphanages and stuff. Then was traveling out to villages very far and these kids have got nothing they've never seen tvs they've never seen mobile phones they don't have no electricity there no running water 
so whenever I think my life's bad or things ain't happening for me, I always just think about that. And I just think the problems I have is their dream. Do you know what I mean? They'd love to have the problems I have. So I just think, you know what? Yeah, so I feel like the problems they have, are, uh, the problems I have is a dream to them. So that's why I don't believe, um, I don't tell myself I'm depressed. I might be having a bit more of a non-energetic day, but I'm blessed. I have everything I need. I'm healthy. My son's healthy. I've got money. I've got a roof over my head. I've got money to buy food with. I'm no means a millionaire, but I'm more than okay to look after myself. So I'm blessed. So I don't really believe I have a right to be depressed. So I don't tell myself I'm depressed. Have you gone through depression? I don't believe in depression. Because I, I think depression is a luxury, man. I feel like people say, look, it is a chemical. Some people, it, it probably is a chemical imbalance in the head. I get that. But even though I feel like the states I've been in, people would say I'm depressed. I just refuse to accept it because I don't like depression. So I'm not saying I've got it. And it's like a defense mechanism. No, nah, I'm not depressed. And do you think all these kids, like when I was in Gambia, do you think they've got depression? They're too worried about survival. They don't have the luxury to sit and be depressed. Because if they say I'm to be depressed, they're going to die. The kids are going to die. They need to go out and make food and they need to go out and work and try and find a way to survive. So, yeah, I try and not. De depression is definitely real, but I don't believe in it, if that makes sense. I told myself it's not real. Yeah, I mean, uh, listen, I've, I've heard this, um, you know, well, listen, let's kind of say it how it is. We've, we've heard Andrew Tate have the, the, the same um, views on on depression, um, but I think a lot of it gets clipped out without the context of yeah. why he's saying it. Um, and I think that if that works for you to not get depressed by refusing to accept it, to acknowledge it for yourself, I, I don't see an issue with that. I think yeah. if you're trying to entice people to think the way you do, um, to help then you. There, could, there could be an issue there because that's their problems maybe, you know, they're not similar to yours and the way yeah. you're dealing with them is not similar to how they're dealing with them. Yeah. So. Just to say, I didn't get that from him. I've always said this, but he does obviously, he obviously has a huge platform, so he says, but I've always said that now, like, not, I probably, he is probably a help, he, he is probably a reason why I've used it in that way, um, because obviously I've heard him say it also, so it might be subconsciously why I've said it in that manner, but I've always like, no, I'm not depressed. Do you know what I mean? So I've always had that same theory in my head anyway. Um, but maybe I've used it, maybe I've said it in the same way from him, probably sub subconsciously listening to it. But yeah, I I'm don't. So I'm sure a lot of people would like to have that attitude if yeah. that works for them. Do you know what I mean? Because I, I remember talking to Billy Joe Saunders about it, and he had this attitude was that whatever it is, I'll just get on with it. Mm. And yes, just, just whatever it is, whatever it is, I'll just pick myself up and get on with it. Yeah, you and have that's to. the way it works for him. Yeah. So. If that works for him, great for Billy Joe, if, it, yeah. if it's working. Yeah. So, Whatever works for people works. You just got to look. Everyone lives their own life. If it, something works for you, take it. If it doesn't, don't take it. But, yeah, you just got to put one foot forward in front of the other. One thing I'm very good at, though, is taking knockbacks in life and downfalls in life. Like I, It's almost a talent of mine. <laughs> I guess I'm so used to it. Like, if something bad happens... I'll give myself, this is my rule, I always give myself five minutes to be, if it's something, that, if it's something bad that happens that I can't change, and it's out of my hands and I can't change it, I give myself five minutes to be annoyed about it, that's it, I keep it moving. Because what's the point in me sulking about something I can't change? I'm not going to let it have that much power over me. I've had that many, literally everything good I try and do in my life, it gets knocked back, every time nearly. But I have to keep going, putting one foot forward in front of the other. Life's full of knockbacks. But bro, if you actually understood the amount of things I've tried to do, and the amount of things that have flopped, you'd be like, I don't even know why you're still saying so many things. And I'm happy. I'm thinking, yeah, it's going, 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 and it all crumbles. And I'm just like, oh. I'll be annoyed about it. Then I'll go again. Got to try another way. I'll go again. You just got to keep putting one foot forward in front of the other because what we're going to do, melt down. Would you call yourself an emotional person? When was the last time you were fighting back in the tears? Do you fight them back? Sometimes I can tell whether you could be an emotional person, but sometimes... You give the the opposite vibe. I don't really, I never, I, I feel a lot of stuff. I have a lot of emotions, but I don't cry hardly ever. There'll be years between me crying, like years. Um, if someone, but say if something, say if a family member dies, I can't handle it, bro, it breaks me in half. You know, because I love my family so much, it hurts me bad. Like, it really upsets me really bad. Um, but, I just don't cry. I just, 
I just not things make me cry. I maybe probably all the trauma I went through as a kid, yeah, this and that. Like when I went to prison, I didn't cry the whole time, nothing. And it was just like, what's crying gonna solve? Do you know what I mean? But having said that, if I watch Comic Relief and I see them kids, I'll cry my eyes out. So it depends, but I just don't cry. My therapist made me cry once, which I was annoyed about because I never wanted to cry. But when she brings up real stuff that I went through as a kid and she connects the dots, I've held back tears a few times in there and then she's also made me cry once. But as a whole, no, I don't really, I don't really cry. I'm not a crier, but I feel a lot of emotions. I feel things deeply, I'm very deep. Um, and I also have borderline personality borderline personality disorder, which got diagnosed a few years ago, which I wish I knew I had when I was younger. That comes from like abandonment issues as a child and your adolescence and a multiple things. And it basically just means like, when certain things happen to me, I'll, it'll hurt me a lot deeper than it would the average person. And the average person might go through something and they, they ultimately know, okay, they're gonna go through this patch and life goes on ways. I just think that's it, life's over. Like, there's no looking past this point. So I feel things very, very deeply um, with certain with certain situations. So I've, I do. Ha I'm a very emotional person. I just don't cry much. I just go very quiet. Who and fights for you? Like who's in your corner? Fight day or night, rain or shine. Who's always there for you? I feel like I've got a good, good family and good friends. And I reckon if I needed them for anything, they would be there for me, if I, actually, if I rang them. But then there's only certain people that really know me. So like I can be at a certain way, they'll look at me and they'll know if there's something I'm right. That's my nana and my granddad, who are like my best friends. I absolutely adore my nana and granddad. They are so, so pivotal in my life. And they're very, um, the proper, give me stability. They're such a God blessing and a godsend. And they'll know, they know me, I can be quiet and they'll know. Like, What's up with you? Even if I'm, I feel like I'm acting normal, they know me. They'll know if there's something up, something playing on my mind. My cousin Myron, he's very, very close to me. He's like, he's my best friend, man. I'd, I'd literally die for him in a heartbeat. And he knows me very well. And he would, he's one person that I know no matter what the situation is where, if I needed him, he's coming. Or if I needed him for anything, he's got my back. Um, and also my dad's very loyal to me as well. Um, and I've got a lot of people that are loyal to me, man. A lot of good friends and family. But I'd say they're the closest people that I'm closest to and they understand me a lot. How old are you now? 32. Thanks, 32. thanks for being here. I know there's, a, there's an obvious answer to this, but I want you to kind of think away from this and you'll understand what I'll say. If a 32-year-old Ty Mitchell can go back in time to give advice to an 18-year-old Ty Mitchell, and I, when I say there's an obvious thing there, mm. which I'm not referring yeah, yeah. to that, I'm talking about as an 18-year-old, what would you tell yourself right now? I'd just I'd sit down with myself and tell me how fast life goes by. Because I remember adults always telling me how quick life goes and you just think, yeah, whatever. Like, you don't really, you have to go through it yourself. And I'd teach myself about emotional intelligence. I'd have a conversation with myself about why I feel the way I do and certain things. And I would say, get your head down, stick in that gym, and make something of your life. Um, because even at 18, I never, I was always out. I wouldn't, I wouldn't train properly. Like I said, boxing is my job. It wasn't my passion. It's just something I was good at. But people would all say the same thing. I tell you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, um, a personal trainer of mine called Kurt Gibbons, and he said, "You're easy to beat." in boxing match, easy. And I remember feeling dead offended. Like, oh, well, I can't get beat. Who's going to beat me? This and that. As a cocky young kid. He said, it's easy to beat you. Take you past three rounds. He goes, he goes, no one in the world will beat you for the first three rounds. He goes, you're one of the best fighters I've ever seen for three rounds. He goes, boxing's not three rounds. He goes, easy. Beat, take you past three rounds, you're going to drop. And he was right. Every time I'd fight, if it got past three rounds, I'd fall apart. And that's because I didn't train. I wasn't disciplined and this and that. And I was a bit immature and I wanted to chase girls and I wanted to do this and go clubbing and this and that. Um, so yeah, it's like take you past three rounds and boxing's not three rounds, is it? I wish it was because I'd be a lot better <laughs> than what I was. But yeah, so um, yeah, I just wish I'd just took, I, I really wish I would have just given myself, at 18 years old, I wish I'd have given myself 10 years to just put your head down and train. Because in my head, 10 years was the longest time in the world. Um, but it goes past looking now, I'm 32. And I know I've not accomplished the, the level of 
you know yourself, Coogan, I sparred all the, probably the best boxers in Britain, Anthony Joshua Tyson, Fury, BLU, all of them. And they all say the same thing, if this geezer would be a world champion. But obviously I had trouble with the board. A lot of this, I've ruined my life myself from stupid mistakes I made. And even now, even now I'm doing the influencer boxing and I'm going to be fighting on the Misfits in September and I'm going to be fighting here on an influencer show. I was having this conversation with myself, literally, in between I last seen you. And I was like, <laughs> you're selling yourself short. And I feel like I'm selling myself short. So I was like, I'm going to do, I'm going to do the two fights with the influencer boxing and the Misfits. But I think, well, I'm really thinking about coming back as a pro. I'm fighting at cruiserweight because I feel like I've I feel like I'm too big now to go back to thinking and I just think cruiserweight it'd be a lot easier for me to get to wood level than it would in all these other two stacked divisions and I just feel like I've got too much natural talent God-given talent to just throw it all away and I've given my life to boxing I say it's God-given talent because I don't train hard but not forgetting I've been training most of my life I'm not, granted I'm not trained very hard but I've been in the gym most of my life so I have put the I have put the years in and I just think, you know what, at least then I'll know, because I think I might always regret it, thinking, you know what, you could have been a world champion, you let it go. But obviously I'm thinking, you're 32, you can't, by the time I get in there, I'll be 33. But I just think, I need to stop putting boundaries on myself. Other people can't do it, maybe, but that doesn't mean I can't. Do you know what I mean? And what a story. Imagine I make a world champion, what a story. All the stuff I've been through, this, that, the four backs, the this and that. Imagine to just... And also, I feel like it'll give me a lot of sense of gratification. Like all the people that told me I'd never make nothing of myself, I did it in the end. I came good. And I don't think even winning a world title will fulfill me as much as doing charity work. I think that will always give me a bit better satisfaction, helping kids and things like that. But being a world champion, I know I could do it. I know I can do it. So I might just fight in Saudi and give it one last chance. Right, final one before we finish. Answer this however you see the question fit. Mm. What still drives that fight within Ty Mitchell? I think I need to prove a point to myself and other people. People like you only need to prove your point to yourself, which is true. But I feel like I need to prove it to other people. I am going to make something in my life. Like, I just refuse to be what my school teachers told me I was going to be. And uh, other people's, from like growing up, because a lot of people used to say bad things to me. And yeah, it, it might have an impact on maybe the way I thought about myself and the way I speak to myself, but I had a lot of people growing up telling me I'm going to be nothing and this and that. And I half proved them right. I went to prison and they're probably thinking, I told you that's what you were destined for. But that was a chapter of my life. It's not, it's not how I'm going to finish my life. And I feel like I need to... Because I, it's almost like to myself here, I can't just be successful away from everything. I need people to see my success because I'm still insecure in that way where I, have me, I am going to make something of myself and you need to see me make something of myself. So I told you so. I told you I wasn't just going to be a nobody and just nothing and just whimper away. And do you know what I mean? You need, I need people to see my success. So I think that's probably the, where the drive still comes from. And also... Probably bigger than anything, I want my son to be proud of me, man. I want my family to be proud of me, my nana and my granddad, and I want my dad, to, my son to think I'm a superhero. I want my dad to be proud of me. And I just, yeah, I just, you know what's weird? You see, when I look back at my fights, and I watch my fights on YouTube, I'd never watch me, I always watch the crowd. And it makes me smile so much. So when I win a fight and how happy my family are, and they're jumping up and down, it really means a lot to me. And I feel like I'm making them happy and I'm making them proud, because I've also given them a lot of pain and a lot of disappointment. So when it's doing the opposite, it's a nice feeling. I just think, yeah, you know what, like, my grandparents are so proud of me now, I've came out, I've changed my life around, and I'm doing okay for myself. But I feel like I need to be world champion, so. Okay, well listen, Ty, listen, I do appreciate you being as honest as, which I know you are, I know you're not one to kind of hide away from things or not address uh, situations that have happened in your life so I do appreciate how honest you was in that but I didn't really expect anything different from you so I yeah. appreciate you coming on mate thanks for having me I'd also hope if there's any kids watching this you can just maybe learn from my mistakes and let you know listen you're not the bigger man does walk away 
I used to remember thinking, I remember people saying that as a kid, I think, no, he doesn't. How does a bigger man walk away? It means he's scared. He doesn't. They know what they could. I even remember it happening to my dad, actually. Like, I remember in a chicken shop, this guy trying to fight him, and he walked away. And he was like, oh, yeah, all right, mate, give it the big one. And I remember thinking to myself, pussy. To my dad, I remember thinking, pussy. And he's like, and he always said to me, I could do, I could, I'll slap him and knock him. What's he going to do? What do I need to do that for? And then ruin my career and my job and this and that. And then now I'm older, I see it. So the bigger man does walk away. So I hope if, any, if anything comes from this, I just hope at least if there's any young kids there, you walk away. Or just don't even get, you've seen as you see the situation arise and remove yourself from the situation. But yeah, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Right, thank you very much for uh, tuning into Raw, the Fight Within podcast with me, Kunkatis, uh, with Ty Mitchell this week. Uh, make sure you comment, like, and subscribe, and we will see you next week. We're out. Join us for the very first IFL Live at London's Indigo at the O2, Sunday, August the 13th, with me, Cook and Cassius, and some very special guests, Eddie Hearn, Darren Barker, Johnny Fisher, and more. Tickets now on sale. So in the words of Eddie Hearn... You get up, you dress up, and you fucking show up.